Netflix disappoints, chip stocks slide in the S&P, breaking below 5,000. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Vu. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the U.S. Israel strikes on Iran deepen the uncertainty hanging over what comes next in the Middle East, particularly ahead of a weekend. And that has kept the momentum in U.S. stocks to the downside. The S&P 500 right around session lows below that 5,000 level that Romain just mentioned, off by 1% right now. The Magnificent Seven, the big tech space, certainly leading the declines. Netflix, uh, one of the big names, of course, on the decline, even though it's not a member of the Mag 7. We are seeing a little bit of a safe haven bid for treasuries or short covering or a bit of both. Uh, the 10-year yield comes down two basis points to 4.61%. And oil prices did spike earlier. The proxy, of course, for geopolitical tensions uh, rising as much as 4.3%, but has eased off a little bit now, currently up by nine-tenths of 1%. WTI 83 and change. Remain? Yeah, let's take a closer look at that geopolitical trade, particularly that overnight flight to safety that we saw unwinding a bit here as the impact of that strike on Iran appears to be minimal. While oil, the dollar, and treasury prices have all reversed those overnight spikes, keep an eye, though, on those folks who are going to be seeking portfolio protection heading into the weekend. At least one of the major options trades this Friday made a big bet on Brent crude reaching $150 a barrel by August. Treasury flows, they show an $8 billion bearish bet made yesterday that would protect against a spike in the 10-year yield above 4.7% by June. And while spot gold has paired its gain, it's still closing out the day with a fifth straight weekly gain and a record high. As for equity markets, the S&P 500 is set to do something it hasn't done in two and a half years. That's fall for six consecutive days. Interest rate uncertainty, along with some disappointing earnings, has pushed the S&P now about 2% below its 50-day moving average and leaving it perched only about 1% above that 100-day. More than half of the NASDAQ 100 stocks are at their four-week lows, with that index now having erased more than three-quarters of the gains it had to start the year. So no surprise that we've been seeing equity exposure among investors dropping by about half for active mutual funds over the past three weeks, with prime brokers also net sellers over that same stretch and hedge funds selling over the past two weeks as well. Now, those are the institutional flows, though, Scarlett. When you take a look at some of the retail flows, a slightly different picture. Absolutely. When you look at certain ETF flows, retail investors don't seem to be participating in this pullback. You look at VU, which is Vanguard's low-cost ETF tracking the S&P 500. It has seen positive inflows every day this month. That's even as the index itself is down about 5% in April. So by this measure, retail investors are buying the dip. Now, positive net inflows is kind of the norm for VU over the past six months. If anything, the few times where you see meaningful outflows, let's say in uh, last December and, of course, in March as well, the S&P 500 was still moving higher. So, Romain, maybe retail investors are the real smart money. Yeah, we're certainly going to find out. I think there's a lot of part, uh, people really questioning now what is driving this market. We had a chance to catch up with Sinead Colton-Grant, the CIO over at BNY Mellon's wealth management arm. She told Bloomberg that Fed cuts don't actually matter that much anymore and that it's earnings that are really key right now in order for stocks to rise, saying that equity markets can do very well with inflation in the 2 to 4% region, which is where they are right now. The problem has come when we've been north of 5% and heading toward double digits like we were in 2022. But she says that they think that right now it's actually a pretty constructive environment for stocks. That was Sinead Colton-Grant talking to Bloomberg News. Dennis DeBusher joining us right now on Bloomberg TV. He is the president and chief market strategist at 22B Research. And Dennis, I do wonder if this is much more now a story about corporate fundamentals rather than the obsession that we've had for the past couple of years over what the Fed is going to do next. Well, I do think corporate fundamentals are an underlying support for the market, but there is a particular problem when it relates to financial conditions right now that are impacting the market. We ultimately think it will be a short-term uh, headwind in nature, but the fact of the matter is we started this year with economic growth outlooks from a consensus point of view about 1.3%. There was a very large consensus that thought there was going to be six cuts, which meant that inflation was going to be benign. And lo and behold, we ended up with much stronger economic growth than people were expecting. Atlanta Fed's GDP now casts at 2.9 percent, and inflation that's clearly sticky to the high side. So we're in a situation that was similar to 3Q last year, 
where financial conditions are tightening now, led by the U.S. Treasury yields, as you've seen, um, that will probably go to a point that make investors comfortable that there's less upside inflation and economic risk. And we don't have to worry about the Fed potentially even raising rates. And until we get through that process, again, a lot like we did 3Q uh, last year, uh, until we get through that process, the market's probably going to st- uh, struggle. So earnings, yes, they're a support. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But we do have this uh, little FCI tightening that's happening right now, which is complicating. And the way out of it is just lower inflation over time and investors getting comfortable with that outlook. They were very comfortable to start the year, mm-hmm. less so now. Do you have, I guess, any confidence or are you seeing that confidence in the folks that you survey that we are going to maybe see that relief soon, meaning like maybe within the next six to eight months? Yeah, that's I think the issue is I think there was too much confidence in that. Um, So there is a significant amount of confidence that you'll see some deceleration in inflation over time. Um, You know, I'd say it's 60, 40. So that's a little bit harsh for me to say it's too much uh, confidence. Uh, But, yeah, I think most people are still set up for the idea that over the next year you should see inflation on a core basis decline in a way that would be friendly for asset prices, meaning the Fed can continue or will, I'm sorry, reduce rates in a way that they somehow get back to to neutral. Um, And any data point that questions that is an issue for the market and most now being felt most definitely in, say, price momentum factor, which is coming under pressure today, which is NVIDIA and Netflix and the stuff that you already noted. I know you don't talk about individual stocks. You mentioned earnings are a source of support, Dennis, except some of the high flyers are, I don't know, giving less information about earnings. You look at Netflix yesterday uh, saying that it's no longer going to give subscription numbers uh, the way that it used to, following in Meta's footsteps. And we've seen how Apple in the past has uh, stopped reporting uh, sales of units of iPhones or iPads or Macs. What, What kind of statement does this send to investors in terms of the information that companies are willing to impart uh, to the market? Well, I'll, do, I'll use a little sell side trick here. I think uh, ultimately <laughs> earnings are a support for the market over the course of this year. The problem with earnings season now is earnings expectations came in um, uh, or inflected higher into earnings season. So the bar was high. Basically, since the Fed tightening program started, earnings expectations had collapsed into earnings seasons. And this was the first one we've seen basically in two years where you had this big lift. Um, so it's not that earnings are necessarily poor. Um, it's just that the expectations were very high going into this quarter. So in aggregate, earnings are strong. They're improving. You'll probably end up at 243 to 245 this year, which is great. Uh, you know, I mean, that should support the market over time. Uh-huh. Just that expectations were a little bit elevated in an environment where you have an inflation concern. Right. I hear what you're saying about how expectations perhaps are a little bit stretched going into this earnings season. But the fact that companies are giving less information to investors who are desperate for evidence that their uh, valuations are justified. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, I think leaning on company commentary about the future, certainly the macro backdrop is one of the worst thing investors can do. Because when we've looked at this using a natural language processing tool, what they say about their own business is actually very positive and has consistently been positive. What they say about the outside world and the macro backdrop and inflation backdrop and uncertainty and every analyst on the street beating them up about the world is going to end, um, you've ended up with company commentary that has consistently been subdued. Um, so I think it's just a little bit more being felt now because expectations were, were lifted going into the quarter. Uh, but I, I would fade this idea of like uncertainty uh, and that being a signal because that has been really consistent and wrong, by the way, for the last two years. I am curious about other signals, particularly when it comes to money flows, Dennis. There's been a lot made of some of the retrenchment that we've seen in equity markets, as well as this idea that you still have uh, money markets that are still sitting near record levels and a lot of other cash that certainly isn't being deployed to risk assets, if at all. Yeah, I mean, I take a little, you know, I understand that view. I just take a little bit of a more, um, and when you think about it this way, if money sitting in those assets is because interest rates are higher, because the nominal growth backdrop is better, right, and equilibrium interest rates have shifted higher, uh, then your earnings growth over time should be significantly stronger. And your earnings growth is significantly stronger than the cost of capital, which is the case right now for most of the S&P, then the market will be biased over time. Money will find its way into the market. So I fade the idea that there is like this uh, lower return profile in equities relative to what you could get in cash. The reason cash rates are high is because demand growth and inflation as a result is a little bit higher than normal. So you're just kind of shifting up um, 
now with interest rates to just help keep inflation and demand growth in check. But ultimately, you're looking at a pretty good nominal growth slash nominal earnings backdrop, enough to offset whatever you're going to be getting in a cash cash account. All right, Dennis, going to have to leave it there. Always great to talk to you. Have a wonderful weekend. Dennis DeBusher, President and Chief Market Strategist at 22B Research, helping us kick you off to the close here on this, well, Taylor Swift Day. Because right now, millions are streaming the highly anticipated Tortured Poets Department album. But because we're Bloomberg, we always like to take a closer look at the economic impact of Ms. Taylor Swift. A conversation coming up in just a bit. And a big question for you, Scarlett. Is Taylor Swift underpaid? Oh, definitely. For sure, given her impact. All right, lights, camera, and deal action. Paramount shares are on the move as Apollo and Sony said to be teaming up on a joint bid. We'll have more in today's Top Calls. And a check on the e-luxury marketplace. Uh, quite a few of those e-luxury retailers are struggling or gone under. My Teresa, though, hanging in there, posting earnings, a conversation with the CEO a little bit later in the program. You don't want to miss that. A lot more coming up right here on The Close. This is Bloomberg. all over the world gushing about Taylor Swift's latest album. The Tortured Poets Department dropped at midnight Eastern, and just two hours later, she announced a surprise album with additional songs. Amazon Music says it is already the most streamed album in its first day on the platform. And of course, her fans continue to drive her fame and economic success to unprecedented heights, even making its way into the classroom, leading some colleges to incorporate Swiftinomics into their curriculum. For more, we're joined by Ryan Herzog, Associate Professor of Economics, who is doing just that at Gonzaga University. Ryan, it's good to speak with you. Um, on this day of the launch of the Tortured Poets Department, tell me a little bit about Swiftinomics and the launch of that album and what it means for the music industry at large, if you were to incorporate Swiftinomics into your <laughs> curriculum today. Yeah, I mean, I think Swiftinomics is really just taking everything Taylor has done and creating a Principles of Economics Taylor's edition, basically. Um, from everything she's done in terms of releasing her tour, ticket pricing, all of those dynamics have certainly contributed to um, our ability to incorporate um, her story into our classes and, and, and get students more engaged. Um, this album is just another example of her kind of utilizing economic principles to her success. So one of the economic principles you mentioned she's utilizing is diminishing marginal utility. She's in the middle of her era's tour in <laughs> Europe. Uh, she's still releasing an album. Explain how that works. Yeah, I mean, with students, I talk about, for me, Easter just passed. I love those Cadbury cream eggs. You have the first one, you get a huge satisfaction out of it. By, by the time you've had four or five of them, you're probably getting a little bit of a stomach ache, right? With Taylor, she's been played a ton of times on the radio. Tons of people have listened to her. Um, her songs are starting to lose some airplay, right? The value you get from listening to one of her hits, you know, Antihero Crew Summer is probably dying a little bit. So it's time for a new release. She's still on social media. She's still getting a ton of attention. So the demand for her is there. It's now another opportunity to, for her to get back on the airways with, um, new music. And of course, at some point, uh, Ryan, she's going to actually be back on tour. Uh, talk to us about the potential economic impact. There was a lot of hay made uh, when we had those big tours uh, last summer with her and uh, Beyonce. Uh, I've seen some statistics saying that for every hundred dollars spent on an actual concert itself here can translate to something like two to three hundred dollars extra spent on hotels and other things like that. How do you quantify it? Yeah, I mean, I think every uh, visitor to a city seeing Taylor Swift is going to add three, four hundred dollars a night in hotel, food, merchandise, everything else. So it's a huge tourism boom. If you look at her going back on tour this summer with her heading out to Europe, we're seeing entire industries formed around Taylor Swift travel. You look at ticket prices in North America, the cheapest venue is going to be two thousand dollars to see her in Miami. You can go out and see her in Spain for $500, $600. So Americans are packing up. They're traveling over the Atlantic. They're planning family vacations in Europe to see her shows. Is there anyone else that has that type of impact? I mean, usually when we talk about the economic impact of something coming to town, it's usually something like, you know, the Super Bowl, the Olympics, something that's more than just one person, if you will, here. I mean, who else has that kind of clout and power? 
I mean, it's the Super Bowl every weekend, basically, um, in a new city. She's driving so many people to these venues, so many people to the concerts. Um, you know, we've we've racked our brain trying to figure out um, who. Um, my author, co-author, Paul Grootman, he does a lot on Jenny Lind and her success. For those that remember P.T. Barnum. Lately, the Beatles, when they made it to America, maybe Michael Jackson throughout Europe on his tours, but there's very few people. I mean, Beyonce this last summer obviously made a splash throughout Europe as well, but not many people are, are generating the uh, revenue that she is generating. Yeah. All right, Ryan. Well, this is great stuff. And as you know, I think a lot of people not just fascinated by Taylor Swift, but really the economic angle as well. And I really appreciate you, what you and uh, Professor Krugman have done to just kind of make economics a little bit more accessible to a lot of folks out there. Ryan Herzog, Associate Professor of Economics over at Gonzaga University. So, Scarlett. The question is, have you listened to this album? I have not listened to you it yet. I haven't listened to it I'm a late adopter yet. to all of this, though. Uh, I'm going to wait for it to show up in some streaming show, and then I'll get into <laughs> it. Do you think she consults an economist before she makes decisions? Uh, no, uh, I don't or think she, so. Or she just instinctively I, knows how to do this? I mean, maybe. I don't know. I feel like at this point she's not really a person anymore. She's, mm. she's basically a corporation. Taylor so, Swift, Inc., yeah. So I guess at some point, you know, she probably has a lot of folks around her who, who give her more economic and legal advice as to... I'm sure there's some trained economists on her staff. Uh, I'm, I'm almost certain of it. Uh, okay, maybe. How much do they get paid? Uh, <laughs> all right, coming up here, we're going to talk about Paramount, actually one of the big movers here on the day, as we're learning that, well, a bidding war might actually be ramping up. Sony Pictures and Apollo looking to join forces for an offer for that company, which is on the block. That's coming up next, right here on The Close on Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. And we start things off with DoorDash. Loop Capital starting coverage of the food delivery company, a buy recommendation and a price target of 170. The analysts seen post-pandemic momentum for DoorDash leading to greater long-term growth. And while the stock is trading at a premium, the analyst says it's actually justified based on the company's execution and earnings power. The shares nevertheless getting caught up in today's downdraft, down 3%. Next up, Ulta Beauty cut to hold from buy over at Jefferies. The price target slashed 25% down to 438 from 585. Competition from Sephora and its addition of trendier and emerging brands is where most of the pressure is coming from, according to the analysts, saying that for Ulta, it's still heavily reliant on those legacy brands, many of which are now available in off-price retailers like TJX, and that makes the analysts way more cautious on Ulta's ability to sustain double-digit same-store sales growth, shares down by 2.5%. Finally, let's take a look at Netflix. Uh, a slew of changes today. Can Accord Genuity hitting the back button on its recommendation to downgrade to hold. While the analyst Marla Rips actually acknowledges a solid first quarter results, she says it wasn't enough to convince her that Netflix has more on the way. She tells investors, look elsewhere for upside and warns of slower growth ahead. Netflix shares having an awful day down about 9%. And those are some of our top calls. Now, we do want to stay in the media space and, well, take a look at a stock that's actually on the upside today. Paramount Global, one of the big movers. This after Bloomberg is reporting, based on sources familiar with the situation, that Apollo has teamed up with Sony to consider a joint offer for the conglomerate. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about the prospects of that deal, as well as some of the other offers on the table, is Tim Nolan, senior media tech analyst over at Macquarie. He still has an underperform rating on Paramount. All right, Tim, we know that the Redstone family seems serious about going through with these deals. I guess the big question is, who is actually going to win it? The Skydance deals didn't seem to impress investors. What do we know about this Sony Apollo mashup? And is that going to be something that's going to be more palatable for those investors? Mm. Right. Well, we don't know a lot of the details about the potential Sony and uh, Apollo um, alignment. Of course, uh, Apollo, as far as we understand, made a verbal offer uh, for a fairly significant premium to Paramount, um, which was rejected because Paramount is in exclusive negotiations with Skydance on a deal that investors are not happy with because it provides um, you know, a $2 billion payout to the uh, National Amusements holding company for Paramount, and then would involve uh, a stock merger between Paramount and Skydance, which I don't think investors are convinced would be a solution to Paramount's problems, nor uh, would it provide you know, financial upside to them, certainly not in the near term. Compared with uh, an all-cash offer from Apollo, apparently, for $26 billion enterprise value. 
What's new and different now is it brings in um, Sony, which I think is, you know, regarded, certainly respected as one of the larger, more successful studios yeah. in the business. And so that just adds a, a whole new degree of heft, I think, to that arrangement. We don't know about any other financial considerations. Yeah. And there certainly are questions as to what the new company would look like, what the yeah. management structure and so forth would be. But I think investors should take a Sony Apollo uh, actual offer yeah. uh, with a lot more enthusiasm than they would the existing Skydance arrangement. Uh, certainly. There might be some regulatory and antitrust issues that might have to be addressed in that, but certainly a lot more palatable. Any chance, though, Tim, that this is actually going to be or we're going to hear something definitive from the company anytime soon? Earnings are only about a week away here, and people really want to know how much progress they made. Right. Uh, and they're reporting earnings a little bit normally than they normally would. I think it's right at the end of April instead of uh, in, into, into May. I don't know if there's anything behind that or not. But look, I, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't know what the exact um, ending date of the exclusive arrangement for negotiations is between Paramount and Skydance. I think part of the situation there is the, the, the interest of, of uh, the chair of National Amusement, Sherry Redstone, to maintain some sort of control and to keep the company together. And maybe that's what Skydance offers. Versus um, Apollo and, and Sony, which might involve mm -hmm. some sort of asset divestitures, uh, some sort of uh, shakeup of the ownership structure. Right. I don't know what the split of ownership would be. So there are a lot of questions around around both deals, really. Sure. Tim, you mentioned that shareholders are uh, not thrilled uh, with the exclusive conversations between Paramount and Skydance because it doesn't give them very much. What recourse do they have or they just kind of have to wait out these exclusive conversations? I guess they have to wait it out because Sherry Redstone has, I believe it's 77 percent voting control over National Amusements, which owns Paramount. So uh, I suppose it's her call. Um, but if you've got a number of large shareholders um, that are making noise saying they don't like that deal, you know, you would hope as a common shareholder that would weigh in and, and influence uh, how the Paramount board perceives this. All right. So you're counting on them to do the right thing then, I guess. Tim Nolan over at Macquarie, thank you so much for joining us. Tim Nolan, of course, covering the media companies, including Paramount, which uh, reportedly seeing a bid or potentially a bid from Sony and Apollo. And I don't know about you, but do you use the Paramount streaming service? I mean, have you experienced it? Yeah, we had it for a while. And then I think, you know, once we realized we had like 15 streaming services, decided to jettison one. And right. uh, that, unfortunately, was one of them. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, the lesser ones, I'm saying anything that's really not Netflix at this point, the user interface is just not great. The software is not, you know, yeah, absolutely. it's kind of glitchy. Yeah, yeah. That's what it comes down to. All right, coming up, we've got Regional Bank Huntington Bank Shares posting a beat on earnings. Our conversation with the CEO coming up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Scarlett Fu. And Romaine, it looks like we're going to end the week on a down note. Uh, I believe six straight days of losses here for the S&P 500. Yeah, I thought we were going to get some help out of some of the earnings. But of course, with Netflix, uh, really kind of disappointing folks and a few other uh, names that really didn't do much here. I mean, what's left if you're scared about rates, you're scared about geopolitics and what's going on in the Middle East. Earnings was supposed to and be now you're home. scared about earnings. Yeah. <laughs> no, what happens? What happens when the third yeah. leg of the stool is removed? I know. Yeah. I, I, apparently this, Scarlett. You're down for a sixth straight day. Well, we are in earnings season, as we mentioned, and you look at shares of regional bank Huntington Bank shares, they're actually higher on the back of an earnings beat. We spoke with the CEO, Steve Steinauer, a little bit earlier on, and he shared his view on the state of the regional banking sector and the potential for M&A. We are very focused on growing the core. We don't expect uh, any M&A this year. Well, in my 15 years as CEO, we've done two larger combination. So that gives you some sense of this. We believe having invested significantly last year, positioning us in the Carolinas earlier this year, we uh, made a move in Texas. Uh, we added three specialty banking groups late last year, early this year. We're in really good shape. The core is performing well. And these new units, as they come on, will will be an uplift. Yeah. And, uh, and that will be a differentiated position because most of our peers have been either reducing assets, reducing loans, or, um, or very modestly uh, uh, growing expenses, in some cases lowering expenses. So we have a differentiated position to play from. Mm -hmm. We're going to do that and, uh, and build revenue. Are you taking business from some of those competitors? Is that what you're implying, Steve? We are. We are. As you, as you uh, suggested, some banks have pulled back, larger banks in particular, not looking at the small, medium-sized businesses. 
And that's our bread and butter. We're the number one SBA lender. We have been for five years in the country. We're not countrywide uh, in terms of our lending activity. So we do a lot of business where we're located. And, uh, uh, and we've done this for years and years, have built a track record and a brand, and that, will, that is serving us well and will continue to do so. We have the strength to support our customers at a time like this, and we intend to do so. What keeps you up at night? What worries you as we go through the rest of 2024? Does it have to do with regulations and increased capital levels? Does it have to do with the election? Um, uh, uh, the, the proposed uh, new regulations are not going to be that significant to us. So the, the additional debt, if, if, if required, if it goes through as proposed, is, is maybe a couple billion dollars of additional borrowing for us, which is not a big number. Uh, that, that's essentially we go to the market one day and we have that. Um, our capital, we continue to build and accrete, and we're, we're already operating as if the Basel III proposal was enacted. So that it's not going to be a, a, a game change for us either. So um, what, we're, what we're mostly concerned about is what's going on geopolitically and globally. And is something significant going to disrupt the U.S. economy? Because if it does, we'll all feel that. But otherwise, the economy is doing fine. The Fed has reduced um, uh, inflation by roughly you know, 50 percent or more. Uh, and, uh, and it's just this last mile that's going to take a little time. But we've been around... Uh, for 160 years, we'll be around taking care of customers as we go forward in any environment. And that was Steve Steinhauer, the CEO over at Huntington Bank Shares. And I thought it was interesting uh, toward there towards the end here. He talked about the so-called Basel III mm-hmm. endgame, which I think has been kind of uh, unfolding now for like 75 years. Yeah. But he kind of basically said, look, we've already made our adjustments. We're ready for it. When it comes, you know, they're just going to roll with the punches. And that is surprising given the pushback from the banking industry itself, as, mm-hmm. long as, as well as a lot of the um, proxies that they've lined up to really make the case to lawmakers that this is going to be super costly. It's going to get in the way of a lot of things. For him, it's kind of like... It's a done deal. We're fine with it. We can move forward. Yeah, it was an interesting uh, conference uh, yesterday uh, by, with the uh, CIFMA uh, on Thursday where they actually talked about this issue. And a lot of the participants there really had a chance to weigh in uh, on that conversation. And we want to continue that conversation right now on some of the divisiveness around the Basel III endgame. Ken Benson is the president and CEO of CIFMA. He all formerly was served in the House of Representatives uh, and has had uh, quite a few opinions here about what's going on with the Basel III endgame. I-, I am curious, Ken. I, I mean, I was going through some of the transcripts from what you guys talked about yesterday and no surprise here a lot of folks still concerned but I wonder if you could kind of square that circle because you have some folks on the kind of fringes of finance right now that are still fighting to block some of these rules but then you hear from folks like Steinhauer over at Huntington who I guess is just kind of resigned to it it's like this is going to happen we need to prepare for it here is there some sort of middle ground here that we should prepare for are there going to be changes well, I, I think if we take, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, I think if we uh, uh, take uh, Chair Powell at his word, and I do, that there are going to be uh, substantive um, and material changes to the rule, I think, I, uh, rule proposal, I think that's a good thing, and even possibly a reproposal, which uh, uh, Chairman Powell didn't rule out. And, and you saw, if you saw our, our panel yesterday, our conference yesterday, uh, you know, Governor Bowman uh, from the Fed uh, said there should be a reproposal. We think there should be a reproposal. And I think the difference, and in, in Huntington's a fabulous institution, by the way, I think the difference is what, 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 what type of business is your bank in? And the, and the larger dealer banks are really negatively affected by this. So while I think most large banks, if not all, all large banks in the U.S., including from Huntington on up, certainly have very high capital levels well before the Basel III proposal was put out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the structure of their business. So if you and, and what we're particularly concerned about is the impact on the capital markets business. And if you look at, at particularly the U.S. GSIBs, they are dominant players in the U.S. capital markets business, along with the foreign GSIBs. And that's going to be very negatively impacted by the proposal, with capital charges going up as much as 130 percent on traditional products like securitization or securities financing transactions. That, so that's really where yeah. people need to focus. And I think a lot of people are focusing on that, Ken. Just to play devil's advocate, though, I think some of the folks who back this proposal, uh, which was formally unveiled last year, look at it and say, look, this is about making the financial industry safer, preventing bank failures, or at least sort of, uh, you know, trying to sort of stem uh, the potential for those failures here. As this proposal stands right now, does that not do that? 
Well, I, I'd start with the premise that we, we made the system more stable to where we are today. Uh, this Basel III endgame proposal has been 10 years in the making, but over that time we've seen ca- bank capital grow exponentially uh, in, in the U.S. And so I think in terms of aggregate capital, uh, you know, we've, we've really hit a, 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 an, a, you know, the target of where we should be. What the, prob- the problem with this proposal is not just the total capital it raises on the overall bank, but again, what it does in the capital market side, and then how it interacts with existing prudential requirements and liquidity uh, requirements, such as things like the stress test and something known as the global market shock. And when you put those together with this proposal, you really do uh, impede uh, capital markets activities of the large dealer banks. And the problem with that, as you know, is we fund 75 percent of commercial activity in the U.S. through the capital markets. That's a good thing. But that's going to have a transmission effect if you raise capital costs by the level that's being talked about, the way this rule plays out. So that's why it definitely needs, uh, frankly, in our view, a reproposal. The Fed and, and the potential regulators are only now doing a quantitative impact study, which they should have done before this proposal. They need to put that out for comment. We believe they will. And, and they really, if they are going to make material changes, they really need to put the whole proposal out uh, for, for additional comment. So this is 10 years in the making. Um, the Fed has already made clear that there will be changes. You're talking about a reproposal. Is the goal here to just not propose anything to kind of keep what we have? I think the goal here is to get it right. And um, if you think about it um, in terms of how Basel III it came, you know, how it, the iterations of it, the Basel Committee itself went through a reproposal because they put out an initial proposal. They did a quantitative impact study. They realized that they needed to do another. Then they went and, and reproposed and rewrote the proposal. It was supposed to be a capital neutral proposal uh, and, and really trying to equalize capital across jurisdictions around the globe. But what the Fed and, and the other uh, agencies have come out with doesn't do that. So a reproposal is a, is a process of getting it right. It's not unprecedented at all. And, and frankly, I think if, if the agencies had done their quantitative impact study on their proposal before they put this out, it, it would have been in a better place. But uh, it's, it, it, again, it's about getting it right, uh, not getting it done fast. All right, Ken. Uh, always appreciate getting your insights on this type of stuff. Ken Benson, there, a former representative in the House. Uh, we should also point a former uh, working in the finance industry over at Drexel and now representing that industry as president and CEO of SIFMA. All right, coming up after the break, investors are reacting amid geopolitical concerns in Europe and in the Middle East. We're going to have more on that when we come back. Stick with us. This is The Close on Bloomberg. All right, I want to turn to the world of U.S. politics right now. House Speaker Mike Johnson trying to push through a mega bill right now with support from his rivals in the Democrat Party. Joe, Joe Matthew joining us right now. He is the co-host of Balance of Power. And Joe, I was taking a look at this bill. This is ostensibly a bill to help fund uh, Ukraine's efforts to fend off Russia, but it also includes funding for Israel, funding for Taiwan, a TikTok ban, mm-hmm. and I'm sure I'm forgetting about 20 other things here. But the most intriguing thing about it is the only reason this is advanced right now, because a lot of Democrats are on board with this. What's happening? That's absolutely correct. And to be clear, we're technically talking about four different bills, Romaine. The Speaker decided to cut them up into separate spending bills for Ukraine, another for Israel, another for Taiwan. And then this sidecar, they're calling it, which is kind of a cocktail of a few things. It's got the TikTok divester ban you mentioned. It's also got the Repo Act, which would pull money from uh, frozen or seized Russian assets. And then you've got Iran sanctions in there. The, the, the problem is Democrats and Republicans are going to vote differently on all of these. So they couldn't likely have passed the House, according to the Speaker, on their own. He's trying to do this in a way where everyone has cover. And then after they're passed, they're all stitched together into one big Frankenstein bill that is then sent to the Senate. And they're expected to pass that bill. The president says that he will sign it. But, Romain, it's interesting. You mentioned TikTok. Mm -hmm. That was already, it passed the House. It was sitting in the Senate, and it was going nowhere. Now senators are going to have a choice to make. If they're wary about this divest or ban TikTok bill, they're going to have to also factor in Ukraine and Israel, and they don't want to vote no on that. So it looks like this Uh. TikTok thing is actually going to happen. 
uh, the old switcheroo there. All right, Joe Matthew, thank you so much. Uh, complicated day in Washington, but they all tend to be complicated when they decide to be productive in the end, right? Uh, Joe Matthew in Washington, co-host of Bloomberg Balance of Power. And of course, we're keeping an eye on stocks right now because uh, we have declines in equities overall. But if you look at NVIDIA, uh, Romain, yeah. session lows for the big chip maker. Yeah. and. Yes, this is a big, big decline, and it's been pretty weak, but for the year, it's still up about 53% on all those AI well, expectations. Right. Well, this is a big AI sell-off right now. We should point out that the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index did enter into a technical correction two days ago here. And it's not just NVIDIA. NVIDIA is down 10%. Super micro, mm -hmm. not so super. That's down 23% right now. You go, you pick an, uh, a chip stock or an AI stock right now, they're probably down a uh, double-digit percentage. A bit of a regime yeah. change, it feels like, uh, with the S&P 500 down for a sixth straight day. Day, and we have another weekly loss here. Uh, I believe it's the, the fourth straight weekly loss for the S&P and the NASDAQ. Yeah, absolutely here. And this, of course, was the big leadership for this market going forward. We are counting you down to the close with just about 14 minutes to go. Uh, Dana Dioria going to be joining us in just a minute. Co-Chief Investment Officer over at InvestNet. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romain Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. Ten minutes, Scarlett, until we get to those closing bells. And, well, unless this market turns around in the next ten minutes, it's going to end pretty much with a whimper. Absolutely. Another day, another decline. This is six straight days of losses for the S&P 500. Uh, it's now below 5,000. And, of course, the big reason why is because technology shares, whether it's the Magnificent Seven, whether it's Netflix, they're all tumbling right now ahead of uh, big earnings for some of those big companies. Do we put it on TSMC and its uh, outlook or earlier this week, or do we pin it on Netflix saying it's no longer going to give subscription numbers? I think a little bit of both. Of course, uh, Taiwan Semi really trying to temper some of the outlook uh, for buy investors. We heard something similar from ASML, seeing the slowdown in orders and some of those high valuations that we've seen on names like Supermicro, NVIDIA, and others uh, now causing investors to maybe take some chips off the table. NVIDIA shares right now down 10 percent as we march to the close. Tom Giles, Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor for Technology, joining us right now. And Tom, it's not just NVIDIA. Basically, you look at anything that had been linked to AI here, and they all seem to be under pressure. What's happening? There have been so many pent-up uh, expectations for this uh, for these stocks. There's a lot of bullishness for AI. Anything associated with AI, even if you just mention it on a call, you can you can. It resulted in a rally in your stock in the last several months. The stocks have just been going through the roof. So I think what happens now is in light of uh, ASML and Taiwan, Taiwan Semi, TSMC earlier this week, people are, give, are bringing a little bit more scrutiny to the AI story. Is it as good? Is it as lasting as everyone thought it would be, as we expected it to be? Um, it's not this miracle drug, after all, and that's what people are wondering. Now, what they're going to look at next week, they're going to scrutinize every number that these Magnificent Seven release mm -hmm. and every comment out of their CEOs and their CFOs to figure out, is this real? Is AI as good, as real, as lasting as we had been expecting? Uh, and right. I think there's going to be a lot of skepticism. And, of course, you know, I'm sure a lot of these CEOs or their communications team are kind of going over their planned remarks and revisiting what they can say to reassure investors. What will you and your team be listening for to determine whether this AI story is more hype or more substance? Is, are the products changing? Are you using AI in a tangible way to change your product? Is it changing for the end user, whether that's the consumer, whether that's the business? Are people really buying your AI story or are you just is this just, uh, you know, some magic fairy dust you're trying to sprinkle on your results? That's the question that everybody is going to be yeah. uh, asking into next week. 
All right, uh, uh, Tom Giles there, uh, our, who leads, helps leads our technology coverage uh, here at Bloomberg. We do want to keep the conversation going as we march towards those closing bells. Less than seven minutes to go. Dana Dioria joining us right now, co-chief investment officer over at InvestNet. And Dana, I do want to ask about valuations here because to Tom's point, at least when it comes to some of these tech stocks, the AI stocks and those chip stocks, you were looking at multiples that were way above any sort of historical realism. Now, some of that was on the hype or I guess maybe the promise that AI really was going to generate some returns down the road, but maybe that might have been priced in a little bit too far too fast. What say you? Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I, I agree with Tom's comments. I mean, I think it's not that the promise of AI is not there, it's not intact. It's just that, you know, the market kind of, it's a leading indicator in so many ways, right? And when you think about, you know, just what AI can do for corporations from a productivity perspective, you know, the, the makers of AI are, are gonna benefit a lot faster than the users of AI, I think, right? Most of the companies you talk to, um, you know, uh, a lot of economists agree on this, right? They're, they're figuring out AI. It's early days for most companies to be exploring how they can use AI to become more efficient. Um, and you know, over time, it, it will be good, right? It, mm -hmm. it should be deflationary, it should increase productivity, but we're just not there yet. And the, and the market bump, uh, yeah. in these stocks is, is, you know, kind of probably premature in a lot of ways. I, I mean, I'm curious, yeah. though, how you even sort of model this, because I remember when the AI hype started bubbling up and you started to see these bids come in to some of these names. The question was like, how exactly are you modeling? How do you come up with a number where you say this is what the value is when no one even seems to know what the final use case was going to be for a lot of these products? And I know we've been here before where we've had sort of these market stories really overtake any sort of common sense on fundamentals. Uh, but this just seemed like it was just a lot different this time around. I I agree with you. I, I think model. So you know, think about a discounted cash flow model, right? And so if you're a if you're a maker of AI, if you're an Nvidia of the world, uh, maybe you're looking at what the demand for this is, and you can create some sort of revenue forecast based on that. I think you know, modeling from the perspective of the companies that are buyers. Um, you know, the, again, you, you, I don't think the models are there yet uh, to even try to incorporate this. And I think, you know, the, the valuation, Tom, Tom spoke about valuations. Absolutely. You know, and I just was looking at a chart actually uh, from a great economist who was showing, you know, S&P 500 information technology, 28.5 times multiples. Right. So when we look at the S&P 500 and the multiples that it's trading at, um, a lot of that is driven by these big growth stocks and information technology in particular. Mm -hmm. So it, it does, you know, it's been skewing. It still continues to skew. And you're absolutely right. Actually going back to just fundamental analysis and how you're, you're, you're yeah. um, rationalizing those numbers is difficult. Yeah. When we look at the big moves today, you have NVIDIA down 10 percent, $761. Super Micro losing 22 percent at the moment. Netflix, which, of course, doesn't have the tie in to AI the way those other names do, yeah. uh, it's down by 9%. Is this a re-rating of the AI story, the AI narrative, or is this just some air coming out of the bubble? Um, I Well, so I do think AI has the potential, as I say, to be sort of, you know, kind of the, the big um, sea change that everyone has thought. But how long are you going to wait for it, right? So, so to answer that question, I mean, uh, it's air coming out of the bubble now for sure. Uh, if you're going to stick with it and you think that longer term this is going to pay off, I don't think that's necessarily a bad bet. But it just may, you know, we're talking out years probably again for most corporations mm -hmm. to reflect, you know, the benefits of this. And meantime, you to your point, you've got a lot of other revenue sources kind of mixed up when you're investing in this big tech. So, you know, what's your thesis on? I mean, obviously, um, we, we talked a lot about Magnificent Seven for so much of the yeah. last year. Um, Magnificent Six now, I guess. But there's a lot of different revenue sources in there. It, it's not just AI. Yeah. You have to get a you know a, a, a bead on ad sales, etc. So yeah. I, I I will say this for yeah. for a lot of um, investors who own this stuff, um, tilting a little bit towards small caps. I know it's a longer, slower burn, especially with higher rates for longer. Yeah. Uh, but it still makes sense relative to what we're seeing. All right, Dan, I wish we had more time. Uh, we have to get you back on to talk about some of that pivot to small caps. Dana Dioria, co-chief investment officer over at Investment. Meanwhile, for the large caps, the Nasdaq now down more than 2% on the day. Worst day going back to October. NVIDIA having an awful day. Worst day since 2020. Stick with us. A full breakdown of all the market action today as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. 
And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romaine Bostic alongside Scarlett Fu. We're counting you down to the closing bell. You're here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Carol Masser and Tim Stenevik. Alex Steele taking a well-deserved day off. Welcome to our audiences across all of our Bloomberg platforms. A pretty big sell-off going on right now, Carol, yeah. in the S&P and the NASDAQ drag down by big tech. Yeah, absolutely. Like across the board, I just heard you talking on the TV side of things, Romain, about NVIDIA and having its worst day in several years. I was looking at NVIDIA from March 25th when we saw that high on that name to today. We are down just shy of 20 percent. So very much a different rethink, uh, at least in today's trade uh, when it comes to NVIDIA and really over the last couple of weeks here. Well, earlier in our program, um, can, Abigail Doolittle was can on. I, sorry, yes, just, go just ahead. to Carol's point, too, because I was actually looking at that, too. And then you go back to that, Mark, at least with the NASDAQ 100, you go back to that March high, yeah. that March 22nd high. And I was going through the numbers here. I, I mean, we're down like 7% or something from that, mm -hmm. which is just insane, given yeah. that we're only up like 9%. And I think we might have to recalibrate that given the selling into the close. I'm calling it the reset week. I really yeah. feel like things, the tone is changing a little but bit. That's not, but it, is this a or reset? Long. I mean, you're talking yeah. about erasing like almost all the gains for the year. That's worse yeah. than a reset. I that's mean, right. Dennis Gartman was on earlier today with uh, I saw Abigail that. Doolittle. Yeah. And he said- with Abigail Doolittle. Yeah, he, for Options Insight. And oh. he said- we he said Everybody. The bear market <laughs> is just beginning. This is a bear market that's been we long overdue, he says. And he's, you know, he's bearish right now. So he sees a bit of a regime change here in the markets. But, I mean, let's let's also not forget that we have a couple of things going on, right? Fears of Middle East retaliation over the weekend. There's no economic data today. And there's a lot of nervousness, nervousness before the MAG-7 start reporting their earnings next week. So you combine that all together, why be long? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, well said there. And let's take a look through the numbers here, and we'll start with the green on the screen. That belongs to the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is higher on the day by about 200 points, or about six-tenths of a percent here on the day. It takes a while for these numbers to settle, but one tick up or down is going to be the difference between whether the Dow finishes the week in the green or in the red, basically flat on the week. The S&P 500 definitively down on the week and on the day, a, eight, a nine tenths of a percent drop, a close below 5,000, lower by more than 3% on the week. The Nasdaq Composite lower by more than 300 points, 2% on the day, about 5.5% on the week. And let's check in on the Russell 2000. Another down week for the Russell, but a relatively bright day, a gain of two tenths of a percent. All right, you mentioned the S&P 500. We're down, what, three weeks in a row here, Romain. So this is the longest streak that we've seen going all the way back to October of 2020 to about mid-October. Having said that, if you go into the S&P 500, Scarlett, I know you're going to do the industry groups. You've got still 335 names to the upside, actually gaining ground in today's session, 166 to the downside. Yeah, and that's a really good point because you see that reflected in the IMAP as well. It looks like a pretty mixed picture, albeit the biggest sectors are leading the declines, and that is, of course, technology, losing 3.1%. Of course, that's NVIDIA. Communication services losing 2%. That's Netflix, although Paramount has offset a lot of that. Consumer discretionary losing more than 1%. Outperformers include utilities, traditional safe haven, financials, and energy. And of course, energy moving higher as oil prices rise. All right, let's go to some of the individual gainers. And it just shows investors do react to fundamental news or deal news in the case of Paramount, which is the number one gainer in the S&P 500, folks. It's up more than 13% in today's session. Uh, Apollo Global Management and Sony Group are said to be considering a joint offer for the media company. We know that Paramount, the parent of CBS, MTV, other networks holding exclusive talks with Skydance Media, uh, also about a deal. So there's a lot going on, but Paramount certainly a standout in today's session. All right, earnings news. Yep, moving this name. Uh, American Express up more than 6%, number two gainer in the S&P 500. This has uh, Amex reported revenue that topped estimates in the first three months of the year. Consumers continuing to flock to the company's premium credit card offerings. The number third, uh, number three gainer, excuse me, in the S&P 500 is fifth third. It was up uh, just about 6% in today's session. Uh, the lender reported first quarter net interest income that was ahead of consensus. And analysts described its overall report as being solid. And this one, Romain, is for you. Uh, Trump Media and Technology Group, uh, its shares actually rising uh, for a third day of gains, up another almost shy, wow. uh, just shy of 10% wow. after about a 26% gain yesterday. Wow. Yeah, we've had a week. So, so, so the rise today, can we also blame that on the short sellers? Or uh, no? Well, <laughs> 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 There's probably a lot to go around. Uh, Tim, you got some decliners. Yeah, 
that I know about. No shortage yeah. of decline. I wasn't here. done, but I will oh, pass sorry, the baton to my beloved colleague. Uh, the right, Nasdaq 100. Uh, look, we just got to say, it, dropping 2.1 percent, worst day since October for the Nasdaq 100. Um, I want to start with Nvidia. And can I just say, on yes. the, sorry to interrupt again, Please. but on the Nasdaq 100. So I was going through the numbers. Yeah. We're up nine percent to start the quarter, okay. so basically to start the year to that record high. Now the Nasdaq sitting on a 1.2 percent gain. For the year. So what is it, Romaine? Is it is it geopolitics? Is it rates moving higher? Uh, well, is I, think it, I, think is it's, it I think it was a combination of rates and then the fact that, well, you got this bloom coming off the rose of that uh, AI chip trade. Well, let's talk about that because NVIDIA shares uh, stumbling 10% today, um, having their worst day going all the way back to March of 2020. That's when they fell more than 18% in a single day, closing below its 50-day moving average for the first time since November. Not just NVIDIA, shares of Meta Platforms closing down 4%, Amazon 2.5%, Microsoft falling 1.2%, Apple falling 1.2% as well. I do want to also talk about Super Microcomputer because it did have its biggest decline since August, really dragging on the S&P 500 today and dragging down other AI stocks, too, which I just mentioned. Um, intraday, it was the biggest drop going back to March of 2020. Shares now trading at their lowest level since February 8th. Um, the company, Can I just say here's it's 151%? Not yet. You can't okay. say that yet. Um, I'm going to talk about why it went down. Um, it, because it announced this morning that earnings are coming out on April 30th. And last time it came out with its earnings date, it pre-announced numbers that exceeded Wall Street estimates. It didn't do that today. So that has investors on edge. Sorry, Carol, how much is it up this year? 151%. Wait, I, mean, yeah. we, I mean, sometimes things go a little far too fast. And yeah. so maybe the pendulum swings too wait, far, are you saying? Yeah. yeah. Wait, Perhaps. I'm sorry, Tim, explain that again. So it's because they didn't that yeah, with the earnings date? They didn't. They did, they came out with their earnings date, but they didn't pre-announce better than expected numbers. So they did last time, right? And yeah. People are disappointed it didn't happen again. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So Wow. Okay. Um, I do want to also just end with honorable mention Netflix. Uh, despite a quarter that did blow past right. estimates, it beat on subscribers, beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line. Forecast for revenue uh, was a little weak. And then this was the big one. We talked about this yesterday. Uh, not reporting subscriber numbers starting in 2025. So one met more metric that's very important to analysts and investors, uh, that is gone for Netflix. What will options traders do without that subscription number? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's take a quick look at what happened uh, in the yield space. Uh, well, it was a kind of a subdued day here. We did actually see a drop in yields. A modest buying that came in, or actually, actually a lot of buying came in overnight here as that safety trade uh, really sort of flared up. But then it kind of died down. You're still seeing yields lower on the day, but we should point out the sell-off in Treasuries did uh, continue on a weekly basis. Fourth straight week right now. We're up on a weekly basis on the two-year yield by about eight basis points and about 10 basis points right now on that 10-year yield. And guys, a lot of people have been talking about this. I mean, you were asking earlier, Tim, whether the sell-off was because of what we're seeing uh, with uh, uh, AI or what we're seeing with some of these other things. But of course, the rate story yeah. really fits into that as well here. And a lot of people now looking at that 10-year and a 4-7 threshold that could trigger a more a selling. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So kind of interesting. And what we've got a couple of weeks before we wait for that next FOMC meeting in terms of maybe even more clarity in terms of what's to come. But we, a couple of stories, Tim, that caught our attention has to do with kind of money and wealthy people. Uh, yeah. So I love this story uh, by uh, our own Alora Nymus, who uh, talked a little bit about um, the different way that uh, very wealthy people and people who earn high incomes are, um, I don't want to say working the system, but making sure that they're not spending too much time in New York and California uh, so they don't get charged income tax on being in those places. Yeah, because if you're in New York or California too much, then New York treats you as a full-time resident and then they'll tax you as one. So people are taking off and uh, making sure that they leave New York State at a certain time and they're they're watching their hours and their days. There's there's even an app to help you keep track of, track of this, which is pretty incredible. It's, it's kind of become an obsession because the auditors uh, for each of the states are very, very uh, aggressive in trying to determine whether someone was in New York, even yeah. just to you know stop and get gas or get something to eat. And they'll count that as you were in New York for that day. And therefore, for these number of days over the year, you were in New York. Okay, first of all, Tim, you were being way too diplomatic there. Uh, and second of all, <laughs> I, this, is, this story was fascinating because, I mean, we all, I mean, everyone knows this has been the parlor game for a while. Basically, 51% of your time basically needs to be in Florida or whatever low-tax haven that you're in. And then the other uh, 49, you can do whatever. But to see just how detailed uh, they are, particularly with these flights and, 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 and the driving times and the apps and stuff, uh, you know, I guess, look, if this is about saving, you know, several million dollars in taxes, sure, why not? 
It's all about where you keep your teddy bear. It's the teddy bear test. Yeah. Exactly. Or where your dog is. In, Peloton. You know. yep. Oh, that's right. There was a good example of that one. Your teddy bear and your pillow. So your you got to have a Peloton. Peloton. Every question here. So where, where do you spend most of your time, Tim? I mean, you're California. At, at, at this office. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a you know you get taxed true. more for that, by the way, right? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's a wrap. Our cross-platform, have a great weekend. Our cross-platform, radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals, we call it Beyond the Bell. We'll see the gang on Monday. All right, we've been talking. Welcome back uh, to Bloomberg Television. Our coverage continues here. A big sell-off in markets on the day and on the week, and a lot of that driven by a big sell-off in big tech. In tech. NVIDIA shares down 10% here on the day. That's the worst day going back to March of 2020, the onset of the pandemic, super micro, and a lot of other tech stocks also moving lower. Bloomberg's Ian King is joining us right now in San Francisco. He covers all thing uh, chips for us here. And Ian, there's been a lot of talk about, I guess, investors have finally woken up to some of the valuations on these chip makers, and more importantly, some of these AI-linked companies. Yeah, I mean, you make an interesting point about valuation there. NVIDIA is trading at, what, 63 times? But then if you look at its forward PE, it comes down considerably. Other companies such as Arm are trading at a, a way higher multiple and, and you've seen Arm's stock you know, sell off really hard after hours. But I, I think with NVIDIA it's more the actual amount of money that's come into this stock, a trillion dollars basically this year that, that's kind of weighing heavily on it and making it kind of the subject of, of, of focus in this sell off. Yeah, it's kind of the poster child of the AI narrative in the way that Tesla was the poster child of big tech not so long ago. I remember back in the day, Elon Musk talking about how the stock was maybe a little bit overextended, overpriced. Has Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, ever talked about the stock price before, Ian? No, this is, this is not a, a topic that he addresses other than what we hear about what he says internally, which is to remind his uh, you know, employees that, you know, you need to stay humble, you need to stay focused, because obviously a lot of them have become uh, quite wealthy on, on the back of this sudden uh, upswing that we've seen. I think one of the ironies about the valuation is we've just seen some reports coming out talking about what's going to happen in this earnings season and saying, as far as NVIDIA is concerned, it's, it's all justified, everything's mm. fine, there's nothing wrong with the fundamentals. Yeah, the same may not be able to, you, you may not be able to say the same for the other names that have gotten a lift on that AI story. Ian King, thank you so much. Uh, Bloomberg's semiconductor guru, uh, he covers uh, the industry and has been doing so for decades for us. Ian King in San Francisco. We've got much more ahead. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic. Last week, that was the worst week for the S&P all year long. Mm -hmm. We'll scratch that. This week is now the worst week for the S&P 500 all week long. A break below 5,000. A line in the sand that a lot of people have had their eye on. A big drag coming from big tech. In fact, on a weekly basis, barely 100 companies in the S&P actually managed to finish out the week in the green. The Nasdaq 100 was the biggest decliner on the day among the major indices, down about 2%. And that was led by some big drags from big tech, including NVIDIA and Netflix as well. This has been become part of that global story, Scarlett. The idea here that everything that sort of led this market higher through the first three months of the year mm -hmm. to start April, that has been completely out of the picture. It's not clear if this is a regime change or this is just a little bit of people taking money off the table, but you talk about NVIDIA finishing the day down 10%, $762 a share. Of course, for the year, it's still up around 50%, but for today, it lost more than $214 billion in market value and it led other AI-related names lower. No specific catalyst, and maybe that's the, that's the concern here. It's just people kind of reassessing the story that's been driving and supporting these uh, stock prices. Netflix moving lower by 9% despite a blowout first quarter. The problem here is that Netflix gave a fairly tepid forecast for this quarter and is planned to stop reporting subscriber numbers starting next year marks a clear shift in Netflix's focus to more conventional 
national metrics like sales, like profit. And American Express, one of the better performers in the Dow Industrials, gaining about 6% on the day, revenue topping analyst estimates. And Amex affirmed its full year outlook as customers continue to sign up for its premium cards, like the Platinum card, which carries a $695 annual fee. And that brings us to our top story this hour, because Amex's latest results proves that consumers are still spending, particularly at the high end. But how do retailers who cater to these high-end shoppers best position themselves to capitalize on this demand? There's no one-size-fits-all solution. It could involve going private, it could involve acquiring your competitor, or maybe expanding your offerings through more categories. Romain? Yeah, absolutely. And we got some news on that just yesterday here, learning that the founding family did notify Nordstrom's board that it was interested in taking the company private. Some news as well that the Armani family is looking to do the same. Dana Telsey joining us right now. She is the founder and CEO of Telsey Advisory Group. Talk all things retail. And I do want to start off here with the news about the Nordstrom family trying to take this rumor has been out there for a while. But we got confirmation from Nordstrom itself yesterday that, yes, there is indeed some sort of proposal on the table. And I guess my question to you is, is that a good thing? I mean, this is a company that a lot of people said maybe they shouldn't have been public. Keep in mind that, first of all, thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, this is the second time that a bid is being talked about. Because back in 2017 or so, when Blake Nordstrom was alive and partnered with the brothers, obviously, they made a bid for the company at nearly $50 a share. The operating income at that time was double what it is today. Different set of circumstances today, different world today. But a lot of the elements that what Nordstrom needs to do in fixing their full line stores Mm -hmm. probably could be done better in private than in public. And also the go forward, because stocks pay for growth based on the future. Uh There's work to be done over the next few over the next year in order to enhance those margins. So do you think it's fixable? Because a lot of people look at the department store model, not just Nordstrom, but the model overall. And they say, I don't know. Is there life left in that? I think Nordstrom is beyond just the full line stores. It's Mm -hmm. got the rack, which is an off price concept, which Mm -hmm. they're growing and has been successful. So I think, if anything, the rack is becoming even more important than the full line stores. Mm. What are the benefits of Nordstrom staying public? What does it get out of being public? Well, keep in mind, by being public, you have a whole staff and management team who you can compensate with stock. You have the ability to show them what the appreciation could look like if the results perform. And that's the key, performance of results. You mentioned that Nordstrom Rack is where the growth is. Does it make sense for a company to have the, I don't want to call it lower end, but the more discounted version of its brand be the bigger part of it and be the engine of growth for the company than for the mainstream brand? One of the things that's happening with the mainstream brand, and we talked about department stores, look at what all many brands are doing. They're opening their own stores. And when you think about companies, whether it's at the high end, like LVMH, whether it's Caring, whether it's Prada, they're all investing more, not only in real estate, but in remodeling and refixturing stores. Harder to be a department store today, Mm. and that's why you're seeing every single department store company like what Macy's is doing, entering a bold new chapter. Well, I mean, it's interesting, though, too. And Scarlett was mentioning our American Express earnings. I am curious about spending patterns, particularly among higher net worth individuals and those folks who are on the maybe lower income spectrum. I thought those American Express results were very interesting yeah. also. When you think about the 8% increase in U.S. customer card spending, that was certainly compelling. And you look at the travel and entertainment spend, and that's exactly what to think about. That travel and entertainment spend is continuing at the high end to be very forceful. And one of the things we're seeing is at the high end, you look at LVMH, who's the bellwether of luxury. They just posted their sales results a couple days ago, and it normalized from high teens last year to low single digits this year. Mm -hmm. Post-pandemic, when you had the benefit of aspirational customers having more dollars to spend on luxury goods when they couldn't travel and, and go to entertainment or concerts, Now we're normalizing to regular level, and you're still seeing that high-end consumer as evidenced by American Express results spending, Mm -hmm. but are they spending on some different categories? Yeah, good point. Just a very quick question here. Giorgio Armani uh, hinting at the possibility of maybe taking the company public or merging with someone else. Would that change the brand? It'll be interesting to see what happens because obviously Giorgio Armani is advancing in years. There's been rumblings all through the past 5, 10, even 20 years about what that brand looks like go forward. Should it be part of a conglomerate? Should it go to a private equity firm? Because still, the design aesthetic is Giorgio Armani's and he has a team with him. Mm -hmm. I think at some point, 
something has to happen if it's not the family who takes it forward. All right, some potential changes there at the top of that company. Dana Telsey, best in the business over at the Telsey Advisory Group, and she was just talking about uh, some of the luxury spend there. We are going to take a deeper dive into the online luxury market with the CEO of My Teresa, Michael Clear, going to be joining us after the break. This is Bloomberg. All right, luxury e-commerce platforms have faced an uncertain future since the explosion during the pandemic. They got several companies really struggling, including Farfetch, Satir, uh, Matches Fashion, to name a few. But MyTeresa.com continues to see strong performance, announcing improved profitability and preliminary third quarter results that were just out. And pleased to say that the CEO of MyTeresa joins us right now, Michael uh, Klieger. All right, Michael, I mean, these numbers look good. I know they're preliminary here, but 15 to 18 percent growth on the revenue side and really a decent improvement when it comes comes to uh, the bottom line margins here. What's actually driving that improvement? Thanks for having me, Romaine. Um, we, we are really seeing that, as predicted, the new season, spring, summer 24, seems to be in a much healthier state in terms of inventory in the market and our continued focus on the high end, on the top customers that continue to spend, um, also drive this improvement. And then finally, the U.S. market. Our position in the U.S. market is really helping us because we see very good growth in the U.S. market since uh, early January. I am curious about just the business model itself. We've been talking a lot about some of your competitors that have either tried to find suitors or have struggled in some ways. The platform approach with luxury brands being sort of a multi-brand platform here, is that viable long term? I, I absolutely believe it's viable. But you need to focus on certain elements. I mean, multi-brand is exceptional for customers that look for inspiration. Customers that don't come to the website with already preconceived idea what product they're looking for, they're looking for inspiration. But inspiration goes hand in hand with curation. Mm -hmm. So My Teresa, for example, in women's wear only stocks about 250 brands. It's not the marketplace approach. It's not stocking 1000 brands and then overload the customer, confuse the customer. So the multi-brand inspirational model is alive, is working well. We can show it with our numbers, but it needs curation and it needs really the high end to work. Yeah, it's vetted and less is more when it comes to what you offer your customer. What is the profile of your customer? Can you give us a, an idea of the geography that she or he lives in, the age, and how that's changed over the past year? Well, I think the most important common denominator is these are very busy people. They don't have a lot of time. So for them, shopping online is very important to save time to be able to shop at night. Mm -hmm. Second core uh, characteristic is they have a very social life, for better words. They have opportunities to wear luxury clothes. They have a lot of social engagements, they have companies that they run, that they represent. And so these are the common denominators that we have across all geographies. Uh, in Europe, our customers tend to be 30 to 50. In the North Americas, a, t a bit younger. In Asia, a lot younger. Mm. But it's really this, I'm busy, I need a lot of ready to wear, I have many occasions, I, I have multiple homes, I go on vacation. Right. That's yeah. who our core customer is. Thank you for explaining that. Are your customers in China too busy to return their purchases? We've seen a pickup in uh, the number of Chinese consumers returning their purchases, especially at uh, luxury e-commerce platforms. I mean, returns are sort of a, a fundamental element of be it mail order or be it e-commerce. Um, there are different return rate levels across geographies like Germany, the US traditionally had high return rates. Middle East, Asia, particularly China, had lower return rates. Um, the pandemic, pandemic seems to have changed it a bit. We have seen slightly higher return rates over the last couple of years, but it's not fundamentally driven uh, changing the business model. And, and if you go into e-commerce, you have to deal with returns because it's a service element to the customer. Uh, so, Michael, I am curious then. So as we move forward, 
Uh, there's been a lot of discussion here about consolidation in this space. Uh, Mike Teresa's name has been floated out there as one of the potential suitors for some of the other companies. That includes Netta Porter and a few others here. Have you been in any discussions with any of those companies about a tie-up? I mean, there's no question about it. The market is consolidating. And as evident by the numbers, even though preliminary just put out, we are a winner in this market. Um, no one has at the moment this growth level. We, we have always stated that our unorganic growth may be part of our growth strategy. I mean, obviously, I'm not in a position to comment on any specific M&A opportunity, but the market is consolidating. Mm -hmm. And uh, organically or unorganically, we see great opportunities for a play player like us for MyTourism. All right, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Michael Klieger is CEO of My Teresa, a luxury e-commerce platform. I like what he said, uh, Romain, about how his customers are busy yeah. and they're shopping at night because they have places to go with the things that they're buying. Yep. All right, coming up, we've got the top three, where we focus in on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Now for the top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the folks at the center of some of the day's big stories. And first up is Warner Brothers Discovery CEO David Zaslav. He was awarded compensation of $49.7 million this year. And of course, this is a year remained when actors and writers went on strike for higher pay. And we know that there's been lots of stories on Warner Brothers Discovery having to cut costs and fire workers. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, you know, I, it's always hard to say whether these types of pay packages are justified. I will say this. When you look at the bottom line results, a lot of that cost cutting paid off for investors. I know that's a hard pill to swallow for a lot of the folks who work there who maybe don't work there anymore to see that this guy got, you know, close to $50 million for that. But but, you know, that's kind of what they pay CEOs to do. Well, also, he uh, connected his pay uh, instead of to profits, but to free cash flow. Yeah. That being the more important metric that they're now paying him on. Yeah, I mean, you know the parlor game, so the shell game, I should say. All right, I'm keeping an eye on uh, someone else, uh, Scarlett, and that is uh, Mark Zuckerberg's beard, actually, is what I'm keeping an eye on. This that photo was posted him. on Instagram. Now, we should point out, this is clearly a fake photo. It's clearly uh, meant to sort of poke fun at AI generative. But can we just say, this is probably the coolest he has ever looked. I was just going to say, Probably the he coolest he'll better. ever look. Yeah, he looks like, you know, he's going to go join in sync or something for a reunion. I mean, he's got the little gold chain there. He looks like he fin <laughs> someone finally uh, put some gel in his hair and told him that that haircut that he's been rocking all these years is, is whack. Uh, you know, this is great. I think it's, I know it's an AI generated image, but I hope he stares at this and then stares at himself in the mirror and says, you know what, maybe it's time for a new look. That he'll take inspiration from fake AI I generated think so. Images? I think that's all he listens to is AI, right? He doesn't oh. listen to real people, does he? Well, it? maybe he'll change it on his <laughs> meta, you know, persona. And uh, we can see it there. It's cool, if, right? If you go like, to if you were on Tinder, would you swipe right? Was it swipe right or left? I forgot. I don't know how to is. swipe on Tinder. Yeah, I know. You need me. Either. Obviously, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I'm talking Wrong about. Wrong market. But. All right. There let's talk about the third person we're watching. And that's a bunch of old married people. We exactly. Know <laughs> All right. Let's talk about Giorgio Armani, because three months before he turns 90, the designer is hinting at possible big changes for his Italian fashion empire once he's no longer in charge. He's talking about things like maybe selling the company, merging with someone else or the, with a bigger brand, listing on an exchange. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, good for him. I, I mean, look, I, I think it's always hard for these fashion brands to sort of find life after uh, basically their creative spirit, right? Yeah. I mean, and he's 90 years old, or something, right? Getting uh, like there. They're getting all close to 90. Yep. Uh, so they have to start thinking about a transition. And I guess the question is, uh, whose hands do you really want this company to be in? And I think for a lot of these folks, they kind of say, well, we want it in our family. Yeah, or do you fold it into LVMH or maybe the, the U.S. luxury giant tapestry slash Capri? Tapestry, yeah. yeah. Is that a giant? <laughs> Is that yeah, luxury? They want, they want to be. Ooh, <laughs> fighting words. <laughs> is is uh, Capri and Tapestry luxury? Hmm. All right, let's uh, shift gears here and talk a little bit about the market because uh, it was a brutal week if you were long equities, and it is now time for Factor Friday. Here with us in studio with more is Chris Kane, Bloomberg Intelligence equity strategist. Chris, uh, given the big, big market pullback, how have factors performed this week? 
It's been a really strong week for factors. It's really, you know, building on what seems to be, you know, a very strong year for factors so far. So just to go over some of them. So low volatility was the strongest one this, this week. So low volatility stocks beat high volatility stocks by about 5%. Uh, that, that factors up about double digits on a long short basis now on the year. It's not really surprising when you think about, like you said, the market pulled back a little bit. A lot of times investors go into the safety of low volatility. Profitability similar of about 3%. I view that as a, as a risk off or a defensive factor as well. So high profits be low profits. Uh, what surprised me this week was value. So value is up 3%. Um, that's up about 5% now in the year on a long short basis. You know, value tends to be a little bit more cyclical. So sometimes, you know, you'll see value get hurt when the market gets hurt. But that's not what we saw this week. So that's pretty encouraging. Momentum was a lagger down about 1%. But you got to take a step back with momentum. It's had a great run. It's had a great year so far. We wrote two, month, uh, two weeks ago that the uh, uh, first three months of the year was a 98th percentile return for long short momentum going back all the way to 2000. So one of the strongest uh, three month periods we've seen, but this week was a little bit of a a pause. Well, I am curious though too about this week and how that feeds into it, right? Because we talk so much about the dominance of big tech and really just large cap stocks. And we kind of saw the sell off today. That was where was really for the brunt of it here. Uh, And I know you've sort of uh, taken a look here at at how those mega caps have kind of dominated over the last year, but how does that kind of feed into the fundamental factors or or work that you've done on that? Yeah, so you know, the, the. the dominance of the mega caps has really thrown a wrench in a lot of stuff over the last couple mm-hmm. uh, couple of years, right? I mean, the big difference with factor portfolios is wh- how you weight the stocks. So, right, the, the two ways are equally weight or market cap weight. When you market cap weight stocks and then the you know the mega caps dominate, that's going to really you know do better than the equal weight version. So, you know that that decision alone has made all the difference. For example, for value. Long short equal weight has been about flat over the last, call it 18 mm. months, where if you long short market cap weight, so you'd be short a lot of the, the mega caps that have gone up a lot, mm. that's down like 25%. So it's not value that's getting killed, it's the size effect. So we saw a little bit of a reversal of that this week and today. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking I might continue going forward. I want to ask you a little bit more about low volatility because as a factor, you did some more fundamental work on that. And I'm curious, what comprises low volatility and how much overlap is there with other factors? Sure, so there's a decent amount of overlap, especially with profitability. Uh, that, would, that would be the biggest overlap. So for what we call BI volatility, what we do is the trailing six and 12 month volatility or standard deviation. That's how we separate the stocks. Uh, I looked at a lot of the fundamentals of the low volatility and the two main takeaways that I saw was that the valuations are really not much to worry about mm-hmm. and the profitability of these things is a tailwind. So let's start with valuation. I mean, when you look at the Low vol quintile, the Russell 1000, it trades at about three times sales. The high vol trades at about 2.4 times sales. So low vol is more expensive, but it's almost always the case that it's more expensive. It's about 20% more expensive right now. That's right around average uh, going back to 2000. So nothing really to worry about. The profitability is really what's interesting. So the median ROE for low vol stocks right now is about 17%. For high vol stocks is about 2.5%. That 14.5 percentage point difference is one of the highest spreads we've seen. It's about 85th percentile results since 2000. So, you know, the high profitability of low volatility, we think, is, is a bit of a feather in its cap. All right, Chris, thank you so much, as always. Chris Kane of Bloomberg Intelligence with his factor work. Of course, when you look at the markets, uh, not just for today, but for this week, we're, they're certainly keeping a close eye on geopolitical risk. Earlier today, you had the House advancing a long delayed $95 billion aid package that included support for Israel. Let's go now to Washington and bring in Bloomberg Balance of Power co host Joe Matthew. Joe, tell us a little bit more about the aid package that includes support for Israel because th- we weren't sure that this was going to get through given uh, how Republicans were positioning themselves. Well, that's true. Specifically, Ukraine, a lot of conservative Republicans had a problem with, and progressive Democrats, in many cases, were wary of voting to approve funding for Israel. So they've been stripped out into separate bills, and it's likely they will pass when votes take place tomorrow. Israel has $26 billion allocated here. Four billion of that is for the Iron Dome and David's Sling. That's a missile defense system similar to the dome uh, that we've seen in action quite a bit lately, and they've fired off a lot of missiles, as we saw in that attack by Iran. About a billion dollars for the iron beam defense system that they're putting together and more than three and a half to buy new advanced weapon systems. Scarlet, the rest would go to replenish our own uh, munitions that we've provided and to pay for U.S. operations around Israel. The president has promised to sign these if they are passed tomorrow. So we could be talking about a law rather than a bill come Monday. 
I, I am curious, Joe, in addition to what Congress is working on here, there is a broader question about what could come next in the Iran-Israel conflict here. And I know the yep. White House has been very, very involved in trying to uh, jawbone Netanyahu into doing at least what the White House thinks is the right thing. Do we have any update here on what that diplomacy looks like right now? Well, look, they've been going out of their way to say today that they were tipped off because there was some upset over the fact that Israel did not tell anyone in the U.S. that it was going to go after that diplomatic Iranian facility in Damascus that got this whole thing started. So the U.S. got a tip off, but they were also clear to say that they did not green light this operation. It does seem, though, that Israel struck a balance here. They had a couple of things they were trying to do, of course, to show that Iran, to show Iran that it would defend itself, that it would respond at some point to what was an unprecedented attack. But to try to thread the needle here in a way that did not escalate. The real message here, pretty quietly, it seems, at least to Tehran, is that it is capable of striking deep into Iran without being intercepted, the way Iran was in Israel. Yeah. And they picked the area that they targeted very specifically because of nuclear facilities there. It's a pretty interesting message they sent in the process. Joe Matthew, really appreciate it. Joe Matthew of Balance of Power. And of course, you can catch Joe and Kelly Lines at the top of the next hour at 5 p.m. Eastern time. We go back to the markets, of course, because geopolitical risk was one of the reasons that uh, perhaps the market did close lower. No one wants to be long before a weekend. The S&P 500 losing nine tenths of one percent. The VIX climbing up at one point. It was above 20, uh, almost at 19 at the moment. And yes, yields have been breaking out. Not so today. You can see it uh, easing just a little bit to 4.6 percent. But the big loser on the day was NVIDIA as the rally that it's seen in AI stocks uh, unravels just a little bit. Stock, however, still up 50 percent on the year. This is the close on Bloomberg. All right, time for our next up segment where we put the spotlight on entrepreneurs and founders really moving the needle on our economy, the markets and technology. Today, we want to talk about what started out as actually a cookie company has now actually morphed into what is now a popular platform for wholesale distribution. Pod Foods is a tech-enabled grocery supply chain business uh, offering businesses a cost-efficient service to distribute uh, their products. Larissa Russell joining us right now. She's a co-founder and co-CEO of Pod Foods. This is a great concept because, look, everybody knows, anyone who's at least has started, tried to start a food company knows that unless your name is Coca-Cola or PepsiCo, you're not getting on the shelves at a lot of these places. I know things have gotten a little bit better, but for those sort of startup companies, those new ones coming out with new products here. How does a platform like yours actually help them get exposure and more importantly, get on the shelf? Yeah, so Pod Foods, thank you for having me, by the way. Pod Foods is a B2B marketplace in the grocery supply chain. So it's a new business model in the space of grocery wholesale distribution. We're not so much dealing with the Coca-Cola scale brands. It's more the brands that would otherwise go through third party distributors or they're just starting out. And we've created a new business model in that space that's enabled by software and data. Typically, if you're going to work with a third-party distributor, it can be really cumbersome because it's opaque and it's slow mm -hmm. just by nature of the middleman model where they're taking control over the pricing, buying and selling products. So for us, we're a B2B marketplace platform and we move through that product with full service logistics. So just to be clear, so if I'm starting a food brand, I mean, I know a lot of new food brands, they just kind of go direct to consumer, set up their website and hope that through social media and other marketing, they can get those folks there. How does this change that dynamic? So they don't necessarily have have to be as reliant on a Kroger or a big grocery chain, but I see you're still partnering with delivery services as well as other platforms here. So we are a full service delivery alternative to the big distributors. We're a B2B marketplace platform, so we connect the brands and retailers directly online. But as orders come through from those retailers to the brands, we're able to facilitate the fulfillment of that product so that the retailers get a consolidated delivery like they would do through a traditional third party distributor. Right. But we did it in a way that was asset light. So, Larissa, your origin story is fascinating because you started off uh, with a cookie company. That's what you're doing with your friend. You're baking these cookies and selling them, but you ran into a problem. Talk a little bit about how you turned that into a business idea. Yes, it was very sudden. So we had this cookie business. We were out there in San Francisco selling our products to independent retailers around the area. And we were like these D2C brands that you're describing. We sold online. We had our Kickstarter. We had our online store. 
But when it came time to scale the business, we needed to be in retail. And we would go and talk to these retailers and they had real problems with procurement of emerging local, quick growing items uh, like ours. And so we started to look into the space for our options for distribution and they were really limited. It's essentially a duopoly in the space for natural food distribution and then the rest is direct sales or fragmented regional distributor networks. And so we thought, hey, we can use technology to not right. only solve this problem, but also add value back into the industry long term. So I ask you to explain that because I'm curious, who is your customer? Who are you serving? Are you serving grocery stores? Or are you f f serving small food companies like what you once were? Yeah, so it's, it's both. I mean, it's a marketplace, so there's got to be a value on either side. For the retailers, the value to them is we act as the strategic secondary partner. So we specialize in emerging local brands, rotational items, seasonal in and out sorts of products. And we help these retailers with discovery and speed to shelf. We can move faster than any other solution. And of course, with logistics. So the retailers are coming to us for this catalog of products that they can't really get anywhere else at that scale and definitely not at that speed. And then on the brand side, the value to them is speed to scale. How can mm -hmm. they access all of these retailers that are in our network and a growing network of yeah. retailers to build their brands in offline retail? You, and do, we're working with, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, do you give the brands advice, particularly when it comes to uh, manufacturing their products or marketing them, or more importantly, just inventory management? Yes, absolutely. There's a big educational element for pod foods. And a lot of these brands are first just starting out, it's their first presence in retail. Mm. Some of them are more mature and they're just working with us because they want that faster, more transparent solution for particular retailers. Recently, we've been working with a lot of celebrity brands who have huge built-in demand and that's great for us and we're able to help take that demand and translate it into physical retail in addition to just their online sales. Larissa, thank you so much for explaining uh, Pod Foods to us. Larissa Russell is co-founder and CEO of Pod Foods, and that was, of course, our next up uh, candidate for the week. We want to shift gears now and move over to our Muni moment, where we're going to focus on what's taking place in Baltimore. The costs and funding sources for rebuilding the Francis Scott Key Bridge are uncertain, and that has prompted Moody's, the ratings company, to downgrade the state transportation agency's outlook. I'm pleased to say joining us now is Cynthia Nazima. She is Global Project and Infrastructure Finance Analyst over at Moody's. Cynthia, good to speak with you. Um, when you, when Moody's downgraded the outlook uh, for Maryland State Authority to negative, does that mean the next step is necessarily to cut the rating or are the odds just as high that you could upgrade the rating? Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, Scarlett and Romaine. So, yes. Following the tragic Key Bridge collapse, Moody's Racing revised Maryland Transportation Authority outlook to negative from table. And that's mainly given the fact that the uncertainties from the Key Bridge replacement project cost, timing, and funding are coming together at the same time that MDTA is moving forward with a large tree bid and capital improvement program um, resulted in additional pressure to the racing. So it's really a combination of these two aspects that resulted in the negative outlook. Mm -hmm. But of note, um, at the same time, we affirmed MDTA's rating at the AA2 level, which is among the highest rated uh, toll roads in our portfolio, not only in the US, but on a global basis. Yeah, I, one thing that, that caught my attention is that the MDTA has a history of exceeding its forecast. Is it unusual for a state transportation authority to do so? And I ask because we live in New York where the local MTA, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, never apparently seems to have enough money and seems to always be overspending. So when it comes to our view of MDTA's financial management, uh, we do give a lot of value to it. And we believe they do have a very good track record, especially if we compare it to peers, when it comes to keeping very strong credit metrics and also being able to deal with its capital improvement projects, right? So it, it even concluded a large capital improvement project in 2022 uh, with uh, its project under budget and on time. So that's something that is part of our analysis. And we do give a lot of value to its management if compared to peers. How much do uh, the larger or broader economic conditions also factor into that, Cynthia? So when it comes to, to broader economic factors here, uh, for MDTA, that's actually one of their strengths because all of their assets are located throughout the state of Maryland. So that diversity is something that supports uh, um, MDTA's current position. 
And it also offsets a bit of the risk of having key bridge down. And that's why it represents only, and that's because it represents only 7% of its total revenues. And the rest is coming from a diverse base of uh, assets located throughout the state, which is in very good and well uh, positioned. So that's one of the things that actually offset the risk that we see from this collapse. So most of the assessments then, particularly when we're talking about these particular agencies, they do still end up being a little bit contained locally here. You don't have as much concern about federal conditions, federal spending, and what feeds into that. Yes, at this time, when we come to, to federal uh, considerations, right, I think that we cannot uh, avoid mentioning the funding uh, for the federal funding for the key bridge replacement. So that's something that we'll be monitoring, and that's part of our negative outlook here yeah. uh, because of that uncertainty when it comes to that funding. So that federal aspect comes into play with that aspect of the funding for the project. All right, Cynthia, i got to leave it there. Cynthia Nazima. Assistant Vice President and Analyst in Global Projects and Infrastructure over at Moody's here today for our Muni Moment. All right, stick with us. We're going to close out the show with setting you up for what to watch over the week ahead. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. All right, another busy week uh, for markets, and it's going to be even busier next week. We're going to start overseas with Sir Elon Musk scheduled to visit, well, the country everybody wants to visit these days, and that's India. Did you just give him a title, sir? I, I did, yeah, wow. absolutely, yeah. Okay, well, Elon Musk, yeah, he's going to be meeting with uh, the president, the prime minister, uh, Narendra Modi, of course, who is running for re-election. Uh, and, of course, he's expected to announce Tesla plans to open a factory in India. All right. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, a growing economy and a huge population. They everybody get the special magic of Elon Musk. Everybody goes there. Tim Cook, Elon Musk, everybody's going to be there. We should point out, we're also going to get Tesla earnings next week as well. On Tuesday, mm -hmm. uh, that could be potentially interesting. And we're also going to hear from Sir Jamie Dimon. I knew you were going to give yeah. him the title. Yeah. <laughs> and that was expected. Sir Jamie Dimon will be speaking at the Economic Club of New York. Uh, of course, he's... Uh, He's prone to talking about a lot of different things. Right? Yeah. He's very opinionated. We'll share his view on the economy, I'm sure, yeah. on uh, banking regulations and, of yeah. course, on uh, the state of the consumer as well and the Federal Reserve. Do you think he's going to talk about when he's going to retire? <laughs> Five years, I think that's what he's going to say. A busy week uh, for earnings. In fact, we get more than 100 S&P companies reporting next week and a couple big ones on Wednesday, including Boeing. Yeah, Boeing is expected to, of course, uh, post an operating loss. And the big question is just how much deliveries have declined and what that means for the bottom line. I'm not even sure that the financials matter as much as what the company says in terms of how it's positioning itself. Uh, on that same day, we are going to get meta earnings. And, of course, that really kind of takes us into the meat here, Scarlett, mm -hmm. of tech earnings, which are really going to drop hard on Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, big, uh, magnificent seven earnings uh, coming up. We're going to hear from Microsoft. We're going to hear from Alphabet. We're going to hear from Meta, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. Tesla, as well as Intel. So a lot of focus on that AI narrative and how it's playing out, especially with NVIDIA and those AI-tied stocks falling so much today. And in addition to chewing on that, Scarlett, you're going to have to chew on monetary policy as well as fresh economic data here in the U.S. Yeah, the Bank of Japan holds its interest rate meeting, its policy meeting. Uh, it's seen holding rates steady after cutting it for the first time in 17 years at the last meeting. Uh, they will be revising their CPI forecast. And we get PCE here. We get PCE and the first read on those GDP numbers from the most recent quarter. We'll have full coverage of that all next week right here on The Close. Join us then. In the meantime, stick around. Balance of Power is coming up next. This is Bloomberg.